Addiction's like a parasite. It gets you when you're at your absolute lowest. I left school at 16 with no GCSEs, failing everything. Bullied by my boss in a recruitment job. There was always a running joke, like, what, what are we going to do, Henry? And I'd be like, oh, don't worry. Henry knows how to wing it. So I had this big seven-figure business. I was winging it. And I remember him saying to me, Henry, your business is, is too far gone. You need to go, go under. And I remember thinking, what? And before I knew it, I was relapsing on my drug addiction. It's truly humbled me and taken me to a place where I have so much more compassion and time for people. It was tough, yeah. but also it restarted my life. Henry Guyben, welcome to the Inspired By Show. Thank you. It's great to be here. Do you know what? It's really weird because for anyone that's watching, we are sat in the same studio. I've recently just interviewed, been on, interviewed on your podcast yeah. and we have now turned the tables. We so have. welcome to <laughs> our show. Um, this is really good because you interviewed me first. So I got a bit of a flavor of, yes. of, of how we can co have a conversation and chat. Yeah. Um, for anyone who doesn't know you, one of the things that I find fascinating about you, Henry, is obviously your real obsession with failing forward. And that's obviously what your podcast is about. Where did this sort of concept of failing forward come from for you? so it's i'll take you back to to when i was a childhood firstly i think um failure is is just i just spent so many years avoiding failure because i was so scared of it um and then i realized that failure is part of the process um but i'll take you back to my childhood my um, parents ran small businesses everything from my dad doing a meat wholesale supply, supply round uh, they ran restaurants um they were they they both came from working class backgrounds um and parents didn't have businesses and they decided to start a small business of a restaurant um and then um, my, me and my sister were born and my mum um, read when I was about six years old a article um, by Richard Branson who basically was saying you need to make sure that you put your kids into difficult challenging environments and making sure that, that you're not wrapping them in cotton wool which was great advice. Um, so my mum, I lived in a village um, in Suffolk, um, my mum decided that um, I would walk to school at I think I was six or seven years old, which you could imagine now you just wouldn't do that. I've got an eight-year-old daughter and she wants to walk to school on her own, but but we we don't allow her. Um, and my sister, being five years older than me, told me this story about the churchyard that we walked. I walked through about there was a pond there, and and that that all all these people would come out of the pond. And I, I remember being dropped off at this cut through and. I'd actually been taken there the day before to be shown the route to be able to walk to school, um, really rural Suffolk. Um, and I walked down um, this footpath um, across a field and I got to a fork and I didn't know whether to go left or right. Um, and I went left and got lost, ended up back on the, the country lane, falling in a ditch and being pulled out of a ditch by another mother. Um, and that was my first, what I call failure. I got lost. Um, and since then, Sarah, my wife, always says, you have got like a tom-tom implant in your brain. Like your sense of direction is immensely good. And I always put it back to the fact that I got lost. I was like a scared little boy that got lost. And that that first failure, I learned about being aware of my surroundings. And now everywhere I walk, I, I see different surroundings. So that's really where failure, the first failure started for me. And after that, I then went through school and my parents moved me around so much um, because my dad bought and sold houses. He would renovate a house, we'd live in a caravan for three years, like he'd buy absolute wrecks of houses, like there'd literally be a frame of a house and we'd put a caravan next to it. And I spent my weekends pushing wheelbarrows around trying to make pocket money. Um, but that led to me being a very disruptive child. Um, I haven't ever been diagnosed with ADHD, but I can't sit still, plus being moved around. Um, uh, um, home a lot uh, meant that I just didn't really engage at school so I left school at 16 um, with no GCSEs failing everything um, my school prom I got most likely to go to jail award which you could imagine no way. my mum was really happy about oh um, I haven't been to jail um, so I've managed to to make it 24 years now without going to jail um, but that was kind of my school upbringing I was very disruptive as a child um, and when I failed um, all my GCSEs my dad sat me down and gave me some advice he said Henry look don't worry I didn't do well at school either. Make sure that you stay determined, committed, and never give up. Oh, and one last thing, make sure you start a business as young as possible because he didn't start to his mid-30s and he always said, I wish I'd started a business younger. Um, so after leaving school and failing at filling my GCSEs, I then went out um, and did a few different jobs um, 
I did customer service and end up in sales. Like most people end up in sales because it's an easy entry job. So I end up doing doing sales and doing all these office jobs um, and then spending a um, a lot of time looking out the window going, oh, why am I in this office? And I was bullied um, by a uh, by my boss in a recruitment job. Um, and I just remember thinking, this is just rubbish. Like what am I doing in, in this office? Um, so I became a tree surgeon randomly. Um, I left been in the office um i was out of work for a few months and my friend best friend from school toby phoned me up and said oh my boss is looking for some tree surgeons so i was like okay cool i'll go and be a tree surgeon as you do um and as soon as i got into that i went okay this is a this is something i could start my own business in um and i did three years i was 21 at this point i did three years um and at 24 um i went i, I went okay i'm gonna start my own business now um started my own business um and for a good couple of years i was 24 years old i didn't really put my all into it. I was still going out, having fun, partying with my friends, all that kind of stuff. Um, and at 27, uh, me and my wife, uh, we've been together since I was 20. So we've been together 20 years now. Um, we decided to get married. And that's when I started looking forward and going, okay, well, maybe I need to take this business thing a bit more seriously. Um, and I was quite good what I thought was good at business at that point. So I'd failed on my GCSEs. I was hard working driven committed like everything my dad said start a business when i was young um and one thing i did well is i looked after my staff like i've always been i'm always been a people person um and i started looking after my staff and what happens when you look after the staff um and we all talk about culture i didn't know the word culture i didn't have like the self-development world is so um was so far away from me at that point but i started looking after my team and they would work twice as hard for me. We'd all have a beer on a Friday um, and the business started to grow. We started to find new clients. I'd taken a bit of my sales background and knew how to sort of push a business forward. And before I knew it, we had five staff, then 10, then 20, wow. then 30, then 47. We were turning over seven figures. Um, I had no clue what I was doing. I was I was winging it. Wow. completely winging it so i had this big seven figure business um literally winging it there was always a running joke um that um like what, what are we going to do henry and i'd be like oh don't worry henry knows how to wing it and i and i would just be like we, it would be in the office we'd have we had a big office team a big management team um i hadn't read any books by this point um i hadn't been on any courses i didn't have a mentor um i had this massive ego um but like, you know what they say about ego, when people are winging it more, the ego gets bigger to try and protect yeah. yourself. So I had this big ego um, and I had this massive, massive business um, and things were uh, good to start with. They were really good. We had, we bought a house, we had, I had a kit car, we had some nice material things. Um, and then... Um, I always say business was simple, not easy, because I was up at five every day and I'd work probably till nine, 10 o'clock every day. Um, we didn't have children at this point, so um, my lifestyle could take me working that many hours. I was young, so I had the energy to be able to work. You know, I was sort of mid to late 20s, so I had the energy to be able to work that much. Um, and what I was doing as a business owner was just filling in all the cracks of not knowing what I was doing by working really hard, like my dad said work really hard oh my gosh. like his advice was great work hard be committed start a business when you're really really young but he missed one vital bit of information out and i believe that was learn how to run a business mm. like you can do all those hard things and he my dad great guy he ran small businesses he was a one-man band so you can work and fill the cracks up in a business when it's a small business um it's also not scalable though is it that's the challenge it's not scalable and do you know what i love about your story henry is we talked about it off camera when you interviewed me, but there's so much similarity yeah. in our story. I mean, very similar. It's like no one ever really teaches you how to run a business. Um, most entrepreneurs, business owners, you know, they just, like you said, wing it. But I've never known anyone wing it to seven figures before. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's a lot of winging it. And and also I love this the faith that your team must have had in you to know it's okay, Henry's got this. Yeah, well, I think that's where, I, and I didn't know about culture. I was always just wanted to look after my team and I built a lot of trust up with that, that, you know, the most important thing to me was looking after the team. And 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 actually that was uh, in, in the end in, in detriment to me because when, 
we had a big we won this big contract which was supposed to be for five years and it was a framework and again naivety i didn't know a framework didn't really mean a fixed contract and we did it for six months and we went and financed half a million pounds worth of kit um and we got a phone call i remember getting a phone call it always used to happen on holiday i'd like the the company used to implode when i was when i'd go on holiday like i could i could write a book on on all the things that went wrong, went wrong on holiday and i remember getting a phone call on holiday um and saying um henry we've overspent on budgets if we carry on going like the way, way we have we're not going to have any money left and this is september and the budgets get reset in april um we, you've not got any work now for the next few months and we had now I just wanted to quickly interrupt this episode to share a quick message with you. Now I've been hosting these interviews with Inspired by Show for a while now and I've been loving all of the great feedback from our listeners and it really means a lot when you all share from listening to these episodes, watching these episodes, share your incredible feedback and I love that you love it as much as we do. Now my mission for the Inspired by Show is to inspire others to challenge the norm, share their story, knowing that it's okay to be vulnerable and shock horror, take the mask off and be raw and real. So so I have a favor to ask. Can you help me on this mission by sharing this episode with someone who you think needs to hear this message? Maybe there's a friend, a loved one, a colleague, or someone that you know that would really benefit from hearing this inspiring story. If you could do that to help us help even more people to challenge the norm and push themselves out of their own comfort zone, then I'd really appreciate it. So if you haven't already, share this episode with a friend, a loved one, a colleague, or someone that you know would benefit. Now back to the episode. 35 staff at that point so this was before we got to 47 we had 35 staff and um and i remember thinking shit what do i do okay um let's try and find some more work what we're going to do um but my first instinct wasn't we need to lay all the staff off because i knew everybody's family like I knew their gerbils, pet names, and like I knew everything about them, you know. Like, it, it, and I, I, I was so bonded with the team that I was just like, I, I'm not going to lay these people off. It didn't even come into my mind to lay them off. But what I should have done at that point is like any normal business owner who understands their business would look at the numbers and go, like, what's the forecast? What's the numbers? Okay, like we're going to have to make a really difficult decision. We're going to have to lay a load of people off. Stupidly, at that point, um, we we decided to um, keep everybody on. Um, we managed to win some more work with the same client and a couple of other clients, but it wasn't the same value work. So we, this is when we started to lose some money. Um, and then six months later, after getting through these six months and not really making any money, um, they decided to rip the contract up and retender the whole thing. And at that point, we came fifth. Um, so they did it on a framework and the number one contractor gets the work first. When they can't then um, do the work um, or, or complete all the work, it then goes to number two and number three, number four, number five. And again, at that point, I should have laid people off and wait till we got work and then rebuilt again. Um, not knowing what I was doing, um, we decided to subcontract to the number one contractor. The number one contractor wins because they're the cheapest. So we're then working for less rates. We then scaled up to 47 staff because we thought we could do a like a supermarket kind of thing. Smaller margins, more people. I'm good at looking after people. I'm good at motivating people. So we'll do it. We'll, we'll just do more of it at lesser margin. And of course, you can imagine what happened next. Actually, the team got less motivated. Stuff would break. The margin margins dropped and we started losing money um some months we'd make 30 grand but the next month we'd lose 40 grand um and it was just this roller coaster and i remember again working really hard um to the point that we were sat in um i sat with my neighbor um uh, craig um and we used to go around for drinks with craig and rachel and i was sitting there one evening and he's like how are things how are things i was like i'm really struggling and up, up to this point my wife would always say can I help anything we can do? And I'd be like, no, no, I've got this. I've got this. My ego, I'd have uh, my dad and other people trying to help me. And my ego was so, I was so fearful of failure. I remember saying to my wife, don't worry, we'll never have to sell the house. Don't worry, this business isn't going to go under. I've got this. I'll just work harder. I'll just work harder, work harder. Um, and I sat with my um, neighbor and he said, oh, um, have you ever thought about a business coach? And I was like, what's one of them? Like I had no clue. This is what, for six years ago so like the self-development world's huge six years ago like uh, um and i had no clue about self-development at all business coaches mentors anything like that and um he's explained he's an action coach and his name's jeff and um he's, he's he knows what he's talking about when it comes to business and 
I so I booked a call, went on to Jeff's website, and I ignored him for ages. Um, I put I filled in my details in his website, and he always told Jeff always told me a story that he always followed up with me because I was the first person to use his contact us form on his website, <laughs> um, and um, he kept following up with me. And eventually, I got Jeff in to have a have a meeting with me, and he said, "Oh, look, I'm going to charge you two thousand pounds a month, and I can help you with your business. Where's your P and L? Where's your balance sheet? And where's your cash flow forecast?" And I went, "What?" <laughs> he went. Well, where's your PL? And um, yeah, what this thing that's in my filing cabinet, literally like dusting it off. Like I hadn't got a clue. Like I literally, like I was it was so when I look back at it, I think, how did I get to a seven figures with not knowing what a balance sheet or a PL was? Like the accountant would give it to me every year. Oh, Henry, look, you've made some money. Cool. Okay. Thanks for that. <laughs> in the filing cabinet it goes. Um so Jeff was great because he the first thing he did was, and I remember because it was two thousand pounds a month, and I remember him saying to me, um, Henry, I need you to read this book. And I went, I remember thinking, I'm paying you £2,000 a month. I actually, I actually didn't think it. I said it out loud. I said, I'm paying you a lot of money. Why are you getting me to read a book for? Like, just coach me. And he went, look, Henry, your business has gone up through the roof. And he said, you have, your knowledge for business is right the way down here. Like, I can coach you, but you're going to have to do something yourself. And I remember this is the moment about failing my GCSEs. Like I'd failed my GCSEs and what had come off the back of that. And this is why I think the school system can be so wrong in this country that that gave me a fixed mindset. It didn't give me a growth mindset. I left school now, look, now looking back, knowing this, thinking I don't need to learn anything. Learning's failed me to this point. My dad's told me great advice, work hard, be committed, be, be determined, start a business when you're young. But the missing link was, and make sure you learn about business. Mm. And that book was One Minute Manager. One Minute Manager Meets a Monkey. And I remember, um, and the reason why he gave me that book is because I was the guy running around the business with a cape. So the staff would say to me, Henry, can you do this? And I'd go, yes. My phone used to ring off the hook every day. I had 47 staff and I was the busiest person in the business. The guys would come back with a long trailer that we had, and it was a bit of a difficult thing to reverse in. And they'd be like, Henry, can you reverse it in? So I was just taking everyone's monkeys and doing everything for everyone. But my ego was getting bigger and bigger mm. because people go, Oh, there's a reason why you're the boss. And I'd be like, Yeah. And I'd be basking in my own glory all the time. My ego was getting bigger. I'm I'm the I'm the boss. I can do this. I remember actually saying, um, a couple of years before we started getting difficult times, I remember saying to Sarah coming home one day and going, this business thing is really simple, like work really hard, employ some good people, and you make loads of money. Like I'm going to start 10 of these businesses. And like I was so naive. Wow. Um, so we we got the, Jeff, the business coach, to come in. I read, read One Minute Manager and the best thing he did was unlock my desire to then learn. And I started learning and reading read lots and lots of books. But unfortunately, by this point, and it's no no detriment to Jeff's coaching, it was nothing that he did, um, but the business was too far gone. Um, and we ended up having half a million pounds worth of business debt. And then 200,000 pounds worth of that was personal guarantees. Um, Sarah was, pr we had Esme, who was three years old and as uh, Sarah was pregnant with Ned, um, and this is October, 20, 2019. Um, he was born December, 2019. Um, and we had an insolvency practitioner that by this point we were doing something called invoice finance or invoice factoring. And that company said, look, you, you're in a bad place. You've got a lot of HMRC debt and other debt. You need to speak to an insolvency practitioner. I remember this guy coming in and he was I, I it was like he was a lovely guy but it was like the grim reaper coming into your yard every time it felt like like black clouds came across the sky and i remember him saying to me henry your business is is too far gone you need to go go under and i remember thinking what like no i'll just work harder i'll work harder it's fine like what, what do i need to do and he'd be like no no your business needs to go under and i remember going home and looking at sarah and knowing that i promised her that we'd never have to sell the house and the business wouldn't go under she was heavily pregnant. I was really worried because we had some complications in the first pregnancy. And I think, I can't tell her this. Um, and we kept the business going for another six months after that. We took another loan. Um, which you just had a didn't want to give up. I didn't want to give up. We took with another personal guarantee uh, more. Um, well, at the, I think before that, it was about 150. And then we took another 50K loan with a personal guarantee. Um, and then in May 2019, I finally put the white flag up. And when we need to, the business needs to go under now. Um, 
and that business went under um for the for, for the time i actually um the business went under i was sober for about three months and i remember just digging in really deep and i knew that the process i had time to process what needed to happen and um we the business went under and actually the transaction of a business going under is actually quite straightforward mm. um it, it's not something that i would ever advise anyone to do but the 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 it's quite transactional you a business ends another you start another one you do a pre what they call a pre-pack and you buy the old business sort of ip and some kit and everything off of it and you start again minus the debt like it's quite straightforward transaction but i wasn't ready for the emotional part of it and also mm. the personal guarantees we had how did you feel because you'd been so determined even then you're like i can work hard i'll do this like you talk about a lot about the ego and, and Henry, I know you now well. It's even hearing you talk about ego is so alien because I'm like, <laughs> you have like no ego. It's amazing. Yeah. How did you find that going through that and that thought process and that decision? Yeah, it was um it was really challenging. I think because I'd known that it was coming for six months because it was the October before, I'd kind of got to the point where I'd kind of accepted it was gonna happen. And I still I've got I've got a really positive mindset. I've always been very positively minded and I kept thinking, look, like once I'd understood the transaction side of it, we can we can get through it. Um and actually when it was happening, I was quite um quite comfortable because I suddenly started looking at it going, okay, so we're gonna lose this debt, we're gonna be able to start again. Um, we're going to be able to go down to a smaller business and it actually forced my hand to make decisions that I wasn't bold enough to make. Mm. Like I think sometimes some of the best business owners are the people that can make the bold decisions and make those, you know, what's best for the business, what's not best necessarily for me or the staff. It's what's best to keep the business going, which in turn is best for the staff. Yeah. In, in, and and um, it f forced my hand to do a lot of stuff. Um, but it, what I didn't realize would happen um, is that the transaction happened. We restarted the business. Um, I stayed sober for about three months. Um, and um, I've got a, a very addictive personality. I suffered from an addiction in the past. Um, and after the business went under, the, the, the challenge started to happen. We had £200,000 worth of personal debt. Um, I remember me and my wife, Sarah, who is one of the most phenomenal women alive. She is so patient, stubborn as well, but she, she stuck by me. A lot of relationships, I think, would have broken down in that time. But we would argue, of course, because we owe £200,000 um, and we had a baby and a three-year-old at home. And I remember having this moment where Esme was three and she'd run around the house shouting and waving her hands just randomly at times. And I'd be like, she's mirroring us because we're arguing a lot so we would argue and and then as soon as an argument would go to boil up i would leave the house and then go and stay in a hotel or on a friend's couch for a couple of days um and i phoned national deadline and we did this great um they were they were amazing national deadline i've got two hundred thousand pounds i owe and we sort out uh, sorted out all these templates a payment plan and when we looked at it I, it was going to take me 10 years to pay off the 200 grand's worth of debt and it would be all basically all of my wages every month would be paying that off um and sarah's friend um miranda who was wonderful support to both of us over that time went henry she got she's an accountant she went just sell the house you've got 200 grams of equity i was like i can't sell the house i've always told sarah i'd never sell the house um and that obviously created more arguments and i kept going and staying on these sofas um and by this point, the business is running again. We've gone down to eight or nine staff. We're making a bit of money. We're paying bills. Things are going. Things are not going well, but we're we're getting through. And the business has started. And I didn't realise that after the business went under, that there'd be this big lull. And suddenly, I was going and staying um, on on friend sofas. And at first, I wasn't drinking. And then suddenly, like addictions like a parasite it gets you when you're at your absolute lowest and it got to the point where i had a beer and then before i knew it the, the wheels really fell off and before i knew it, i was relapsing on my drug addiction and i had like three months from september 2019 to to the end of christmas where i was just a complete mess and fortunately i had mike and sophie who are still in the business now um and they just ran the business for me i was still turning up occasionally and doing some sales stuff but it was really hard we had to sell our family home it was lot of pressure um it was the um it was the best worst year of my life 
because I feel like we were talking about it earlier off off, ca- off camera, like the humility that I feel like I have now is just so different to how I was before. Before I was just so raw and had, as we talked about this ego and it's truly humbled me and taken me to a place where I have so much more compassion and time for people and understanding of, of people in difficult situations. Um, so it was, it was tough, yeah, but also it was the best year wow. because it restarted my life. You know, that that's where the humility comes from it's like you're just so it's such a a, a very dark place to go to you know mm. losing your home losing po- you know possibly risking relationships two hundred thousand pounds worth of debt is not a small amount addiction it's like sounds like a recipe for disaster i'm not just saying this it sounds like you could write a whole book on it yeah. probably have yeah, it yeah. turned into a movie yeah, yeah. Like, there's so much that was going on how did you decide then like what was going on there for you to go, no, 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 this this can't continue? And because the person you are now, Henry, is very, very different. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I think that, um, I think when you go to those dark places, you really look within and start like I, my ego was gone by that point like that I didn't I didn't my, I was holding on to this business success of having 47 staff having all this kit this massive yard that was my ego my ego was wrapped up in the success that I'd achieved but once you lost all that my ego was gone mm. so I had to go I had to go into and look within and that's the only way because I couldn't hang on to anything the ego was gone at that point like we always say when we start all our mastermind sessions I now run a tree surgery mastermind to help people not do what I do I do I always say leave your ego at the door because when you come into somewhere and and at a point when your ego's in f- too big or, or 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 pushing pushing the learning away that you're not going to learn anything if you sit there with your arms folded in one of my sessions or any session and think that you know it all or you know, like Rob Moore says, to know and to not do is to not know. And so many people go into that. And, and at that point, my ego was so, had gone that I was willing to do anything to try and rebuild myself, to try and work out like, there's other people that are successful. Why has this happened to me? Like, and, and it's about the accountability because I could have blamed the contract that we were on. I could have blamed the economy or brexit or whatever i mean this is pre-covid but you could blame you could blame so much stuff but i had to the only way i knew to get over well i worked out how to get over it and a lot of it was through books that i read was to go i was i was a person who was dry steering this ship there's only one person that's blamed here and that's me and i had to hold myself accountable and it's the only way that i got over it by i wrote a what went wrong document um and on that was all the things that i'd done wrong and it was the only way that i could then hold myself truly accountable like jeff who if you ever had ever had action coach they talk about above and below the line above the line is accountability responsibility and ownership and below the lines blame excuse denial when he was coaching me, he'd always point to this poster behind him and say, Henry, you're, because I'd be ranting about this pre going under, ranting about someone's done this, someone's done that, someone's done that. And he'd be like, it's, you've just blamed an excuse, Henry, like get above the line. And that all rang true. Um, when the business went under, I was like, I need to hold myself accountable here. It's so powerful though, Henry, isn't it? Because I see so many businesses that are not where they could be or, struggling and a lot of the time it is the ego it's like we're blaming externally it's the victim mode and Mm. it's also so easy to fall into i mean we've both been in that that boat yeah um and i think often the bigger the ego gets the harder it is to let go of that and the bigger the business the bigger the ego gets and it can it can become a bit of a a catch-22 um how did you then change it and and what did you do differently this time um, so I just went all in on um, I went all in on writing that document and then focusing really on on what I needed to what I needed to do. And the main thing is January 2020 came. Um, I'd had the worst Christmas ever. I remember me and Sarah crying quite a lot because I just wasn't there as a as a father or as a human being. And I remember thinking, this is not the person I want to be. Like I want to be a good dad. I want to be a good business owner. Like what do I need to do? And I I remember. Um, uh, alcohol was never my problem it was drugs but alcohol was always the gateway um to then doing drugs potentially um and i started 2020 and said i'm going to quit drinking drinking i want the least path of resistance for me to be able to create success in my life and drinking is just something that creates resistance it means it's a gateway it makes me fuzzy um it doesn't help me whatsoever um my problem was always been i'd always quit alcohol from january to my birthday which is april the 12th for last week and um 
and then my birthday would come and I'd then have six months of being like having parties, football tournaments, festivals, all that kind of stuff. And I, I said, look, I'm, I might quit for three months, Sarah, um, or I might do the whole year, not knowing COVID was coming. COVID was the best thing that ever happened to me because I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if anyone else had a difficult time through COVID, but for me, um, it was uh, a good time because everything that would take my focus away disappeared friends social events festivals mm. euro 2020 all that kind of stuff um and it meant that i quit alcohol and have not drank since um and that gave me the drive to be able to sit in an office just me a phone and linkedin and rebuild my business from having two teams to what it is now which is a seven figure tree surgery business again and that gave me the drive to one hold myself accountable and two to be able to have the time and energy and the focus to not have this busy world of all these different distractions because everyone was in everyone was like sat on zoom in their pants basically and i just could <laughs> sit in this office and just you know just sell the business and and try and try and rebuild and it just that year gave me time and focus to be able to really put things in perspective um and i know how pro books you are there was one book that helped me so much um and uh again we talked in in our episode earlier a book found me um or i found a book through the time it happened i had a sales manager david um who worked for me about nine months before the business went under and he gave me a book and it sat on the side. I've been I by this point I'm buying loads and loads of books. And it sat on the side collecting dust um for about nine months. And the month the business went under, I just decided to pick it up and start reading it. And that book was Black Box Thinking by Matthew Syed. Um and that book um he talks around the aviation aviation industry and how um how failure is the key to success. And in that moment, I realized that and this is why I talk about fail forward. So this is a long, really long-winded answer from the beginning, right? Um, that what had happened to me in that year, and it was amazing that I picked it up and read it at that moment. It was like I was meant to read that book at that time. And once I realized that failure, like failure is part of success, pa failure is is only negative if you do not learn from it, that if if you embrace failure and you understand it's part of the process, then I went, okay, so this really tragically bad thing that's happening to me right now this doesn't have to be terrible. This doesn't have to be bad. I just need to learn from it. If I learn from it, then I move forward and we fail forward. Um, and that's really where the fail forward came from. Oh, I love that. And I, do you know what? I think it's so important that you shared the whole story there. And I, I'm fascinated by so many parts of it because one of the things that I used to struggle with is the concept of failure. I was always taught as a, as a you know, a child, failure's bad and, you know, big F at school, you don't want that. And so I, the, even the word failure sometimes triggers me. It's yeah. bizarre. And yeah, there's yeah. um, people have said to me before about various podcasts to be interviewed on. And people have said, oh, the podcast, got blah, 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 whatever the title is, it's got failure in it. And at first I was like, oh, I don't want to go on that podcast. Really surreal and weird. And I realized it was a lot of the ego that mm -hmm. was coming in. And I think it's really fascinating that you can look at failure as a good thing. I agree. Yeah. Like, I've never, until I met you, never came across the concept of failing forward, but I absolutely love it because everything is, you're moving forward all the time anyway, whether it's a failure or, or a success, you're still going to learn and you're still continuing to move. Yeah. So it, it's really, really powerful. And Henry, I'm curious from your perspective, obviously you've now got your seven figure tree surgeon surgery business. Um, you're also mentoring other tree surgeons. What made you want to go into teaching others and then why a podcast? So, yeah, there's a, two great questions. Um, one, it, with the tree surgery industry, I look around at that and see that there's a lot of people like me who are like, I was never diagnosed with ADHD, but there's a lot of ADHD tree surgeons. There's a lot of tree surgeons who have, come, have become accidental business owners. There's a lot of tree surgeons. The reason why you usually get into tree surgery is because you're not academic um, and very similar stories to me. People are not being very good at school. Um, and... I always think what 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 did I need back when I was things were going wrong like I needed what I've created now with the tree surgery mastermind I needed to be able to sit with other tree surgery business and talk about challenges and be able to support each other and work out the the how to create a successful business and people would say to me well there's not enough tree trees in this country to have lots of successful tree surgery businesses and it's not about scaling to big businesses it's about creating a community it's about people having a business that serves them to be able to have the it's not all about being 
millionaires and billionaires it's just going i've got a business where i can have some time to spend with my kids i can have i can go on holiday four times a year and i'm not working 12 hour days um mm. and that's what inspired me to start the tree surgery industry because i thought like i've had this tragically bad thing i want to stop anybody else i would i wouldn't wish it on anybody like i think f- my biggest failure was being fearful of failure like as you say we're all, our ego is all, always fearful of failure like the big f word i think people still like i invite people on the podcast and they have that i get that reaction of like well i don't want to go and talk about failure for um but i actually think that no one needs to have a bigger failure as me they just need to realize that the it's like resilience building you know when people talk about resilience building and it's like a muscle the more resilience you build the 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 better it will get it's the same with failure like if we can be if we can look in our in our mirrors and see what's happened last week that's not gone so right and it could just be as simple as putting out a social media post that didn't get very many likes that's even in a way it's a mini failure like if we can analyze that openly and go what happened there rather than going trying to put it down to oh well maybe it was the wrong time of day and maybe maybe it's because like no one no one saw it well no maybe it was because it wasn't that good and let's have a look at that and then improve it to make it better um and that's where i think if you can fail forward in in mi- lots of mini failures and i was so fearful of those big big failures you know big fa- like i was so fe- fearful of failure i wasn't seeing the small failures and people always say what was the one thing that went wrong i think it was loads of things i think it was just the fact that i wasn't failing or what my ego was getting in the way for me to be able to see the failures so i think um through the mastermind if i can share openly and honestly everything that's ever gone wrong and also get a group of guys to do the same thing share the chair share the challenges then you're going to be able to get to the su- success a lot quicker mm. um and it was the same with the podcast um I, it was just to be able to share everything that's happened over the last uh, my whole life and go you know, we talked about it earlier on your podcast, just being able to be vulnerable and, and not live in a life where you're looking at everybody on a filter on social media and you're, everyone's living their best life because it's, it's fake. Um, mm-hmm. no one's looking for perfection. And I just think perfection is a complete fallacy. It's not true. Like everyone's trying to make right the perfect sales page or the perfect social media post, like just take some action and get out there. But all the time that social media is making everyone seem perfect. Like I just want to come out there and just say like, yes, like, life's good in some places but also we have challenges there's days that i feel like my addictive personality is coming back out and there's days that i feel really low there's days that i feel crap but if we can share that more people just feel like life it's normal to be up and down you know Mm, totally yeah one of the things i really value about henry that we being sat here is you're so honest you know you don't to, similar to me you don't have a filter in some respects mm. like you're just like here's my advice here's my thoughts and that's why we got on so well yeah, right especially 100%. being in similar masterminds and stuff um but one thing i've always noticed is you're always very driven and always very determined and i um hope you don't mind me talking about it i i remember there was about probably about a year ago we were both sat in an event and we were talking about getting this podcast booked in and i remember thinking oh, i'll message you and reach out to you and i think the day after i saw an announcement on social media saying that you'd had a stroke yeah and i remember being sat there going what like <laughs> yeah and, and the reason i'm mentioning it now is because i don't think f- failure challenge ever stops yeah like you've now nailed it you've got a fantastic business you've got a great podcast i mean you were number one in entrepreneurship for a while right like yeah. you've done so well with your podcast seven figure tree surgery business and then a stroke i mean tell tell us a bit about that and and how that sort of helped you where you are now luckily you're you know sat here and I've never seen you healthier, to be yeah, fair. Yeah, yeah. But sort of tell us about that journey. Oh man, it was it was completely out of the blue, to be fair. Like last year, like since quitting alcohol and then realizing my highest value is my family, um, and wanting to spend as much time with them. Um, Esme and Ned are eight and five. Um, Esme's amazing. Um, she is a natural born leader, very determined. She's gonna take over the world. Ned's gonna be a Premier League football player. He wants to play every day. He's left footed and already playing with like eight, nine year olds and 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 and, and wiping up with them. So um <laughs> Um, like, like like father like kids eh? yeah yeah um and I, I love them to bits um so the last couple of years i've wanted to spend lots of time with them and be really healthy like my whole thing is around self-preservation i've not been kind to my body over the years with drugs and then stressful businesses and being overweight and all that kind of stuff but actually funny enough last year i was the healthiest i've ever been and i worked the least i've ever worked last year um i was busy like at the beginning of the year i've got a lot of stuff going on podcasts multiple businesses my whole thing sat with shari we were talking about shari earlier at the beginning of the year was to do to be able to do less 
but I took a month off in the summer. Um, I'd been on multiple holidays. I was all about the family. So when um, October, the I think it was 6th or 9th came along and I woke up in the morning, went to go for a run, um, walked down the stairs, felt very faint. Um, Sarah almost had to catch me. Uh, 15 minutes, I couldn't see my phone. It was like I'd been drinking again. So long story short, um, I ended up in hospital in A&E with them telling me they found something in my head. Um, and it it's it could be a cyst or a tumor or something. So I had three days while they were doing some tests on me where I just thought that I had three months left to live. Really morbid, but I just was just thinking I was I was begging with life to give me fifteen more years so the kids didn't have their life disrupted and they could like have a dad and all that kind of stuff and 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 then after three days they told me oh you've had a light stroke and I was like great and the, the doctor was like what what are you happy about that I was like because trust me I've been to a dark place now um but what that did is it just gave me more perspective of what I want in life and I've I've chased um I've chased money I've chased success um and I'm still determined for that but my uh, my idea of success is the amount of time I get to spend with my family um and it made me just put life into more into into perspective more about we're just chasing you're chasing something or like I I've hit so many of my goals and I keep moving the goals post through my life like if you asked 16 year old Henry failed GCSE Henry now like this is what you're going to have by the time you're 40 I'd have bit my hand hit my hand off for it um but i still some days wake up and go i'm not where i want to be in life um but having the stroke has made me go like i just want to be able to spend great time with family and friends um and have a balance in life more um and it was very strange very strange feeling having a stroke um but it just helped me put things in perspective and now i seem back to being healthy again so it's just a little bump in the road that's one of the things I find fascinating about you, Henry. Like when I saw you recently, a couple of months ago, and I was like, did you not have a stroke like six <laughs> months ago? You're just very committed. But the one thing I've noticed is every time you go through something, you always think about the other people. Yeah. Staff, family, you know, you're always very committed for other people. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons you do so well in all of your businesses. And I can really relate to the whole concept of I'm not where I want to be. There's always other places, yeah. you know. And I hate to say it, sometimes we do get signs that take us and show us. Actually, hold on, careful. You yeah. know, you're you're in the right track now. Um, obviously, you talked about the book that stood out to you. Um, when's your book going to be coming out? It's a great question. Um, it's something that I would love to do is to to talk, but I think I need to get the headspace for it. Um, but yeah, I think that's something that's going to happen in the next couple of years. A fa fail forward book. Yeah. What do you think you would love to share in the book the most? Like if you were to write any book, what book would you write? I think it's just really trying to still promote the, the failure and, and to, to really t talk into the people's egos and understand that we can put the ego to one side and really learn mm -hmm. from it. Um, I still get people now always saying to me, but I've never failed. And, you know, I, I know you talk about fail forward, Henry, but I've always been brought up in a world where like, I don't have a choice to not fail. And I just think, well, maybe you've just not come to that yet and you mm. probably don't even see it um so i i just would would probably tell tell a bit more of my story and just really talk around how as society we can um we can really learn from failure and and really talk around the mental health side of things and the perfection and everyone's trying to chase this perfection all the time this perfect body perfect business perfect life that like it doesn't have to be perfect it just has to be what you want not living in other people's lives like we just get so caught up in other people's dreams and trying to really talk to people um and understand that you just got to live the life that you want to live and be happy mm. with that yeah so much i love that i think sometimes it's also giving yourself permission isn't it to be mm. like my life is actually good and i'm happy yeah i remember when um i think it was about two years ago three years ago maybe um we were on track for about 700 thousand revenue and my mentor said to me no no Chloe you can get to a million this year and I thought no no I don't need a million I'm quite happy like I didn't even want 700 I was like I'm actually quite good like yeah. I used to have this thought of seven figure business seven figure problems that was yeah, always yeah, in my yeah, mind yeah. which sometimes is true but yeah. still yeah um, and I remember stretching myself to work out numbers person what would need to happen to get to the million then and even just the thought of the extra stretch I completely burnt out. And actually we didn't even go to 700. I think we maybe got to 350 that year because of just the pressure to get to where my mentor thought I could get to. Yeah. I wasn't 
just listening to myself and being assertive with myself and going, no, Chloe, this is what you want. Like, this is my perfect and it's good. Like, this is what I'm happy with. Yeah. Instead, I was getting carried away what other people think. And I think there's a risk in, particularly in business and entrepreneurship, I don't know if you agree, Henry, there's a risk that we're going to get carried away and, well, that person's doing that, then I should do that. Yeah, I see that all the time and I get caught up in it. I look through, scroll through LinkedIn, I go to business events and I get caught up in what I think other people think that I should have um our egos get caught up in that um and it's led it does lead to burnout mm. it's led to burnout I've burnt out so many times I, and I don't burn out so much anymore because you've got to learn when to just go because I think you, the self-development world is amazing like I'm 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 so much better off for being in the self-development world than the Henry that wasn't before but also there's a big caveat into that it, and my biggest caveat is is making sure that the business mentors coaches and people you're around um, are genuinely interested in in your wants and needs and it's not to get them to get their status to be able to then go oh I've got this many seven-figure businesses and to follow the to find people that are on the path that you want um because i see so many um i see so many business mentors and coaches that aren't always their integrity isn't always the best for for you and your business um they're it's they're doing it for their their own needs um so i think it's just understanding that and not getting caught up in the social media world i do it all the time still where i scroll through and i'll see another really successful tree surgery business who's got loads of kit and it will instantly make me feel inferior and then that's why I always question people when they say my goal is X and I'm like what's your goal are you sure that does that align with your values does that align with what you really want to do because it's easy to get caught up in going but everyone else has got all this big kit so I want that well do you really what is it you what is it you really really want well actually I just want some more time with my family okay so you don't want all that because that's not going to get you more time with your family I always say to people like people say I want to have lots of success well what does that look like okay so what are you willing to sacrifice because there's always a sacrifice mm. and and that sacrifice could be time it could be it could be lots of money it, it could be lots of different things but I think the more success that you want there is a sacrifice of time and it's not always how big and this is the ego that gets Im involved again. And I think like, it's cool. I've got some guys that I mentor now that want to have a hundred staff and they want to have eight figure businesses. And we've checked in with them and made sure that's what they really want. And once they want to go there, we'll help them get there. But you've got, always got to check in with really, does it align with your values and what you want? So much. And do you know what? I'm smiling because I'm doing this with myself now in my business because we've recently hit a vision. We've made it reality, our goal. And now it's like, now what? And I'm doing the same thing. I'm like, well, the logical thing would be to be the revenue to be this number and the staff to be this number and the books to be published to be this number. And then I'm going, but do I actually want that? Like you could literally just pick a number out of thin air. And I think a lot of time we do because of the ego that comes with it. And not very often do people check in with their values, right? Yeah. Um, one thing I'm curious, Henry, we've both clearly talked about having coaches and mentors. So question for you. Do you think all entrepreneurs need a business coach or a mentor to succeed? It's a great question. Um, from my own experience, and that's all I can really answer for, I know how things went without a business coach or mentor, um, and that didn't end well. Um, Jeff came in, he was a great he was a great coach. He came in too late. He probably came in, I don't know exactly time, but nine or twelve months before the business went under, but it was already in a shocking position. My life since been like in the last five years since the business went under. I've been on multiple masterminds. I spent over six figures on mentors, coaches, um, training courses. Um, and I've now got three, three pretty successful businesses. Um, and I couldn't imagine doing it without one now. Um, I, I believe that I, I think you, okay. So a better answer is, is I, and I say this to, to people all the time. I think if you started a business from scratch today, to get it to to maybe seven figures or not even seven figures, but somewhere that's giving you success, more paying you a good wage and um and giving you time, it could take you 10 years. I think getting a mentor and coach, someone that specifically walked the path that you want to walk, I think you could reduce that time by six or seven years. I think if with the right guidance, and that's the thing, you can either pay 
in time or you can pay in money and i think if you pay you can pay in money by getting a business coach and that will reduce those years down or you can pay in time by making all those mistakes with the right mindset of failing forward but you're going to have to make a lot of mistakes to get to those 10 years whereas a good business coach will show to tell you all the warts and all all the mistakes and they'll tell you blind spots and they'll help you get there quicker so i think you could probably do get to where you want to in three years with the right guidance and support mm, yeah i totally agree totally agree one thing that i found which i totally resonate with what you, you're sharing is the speeding up the time frame but it's got to be the right coach, right? Yeah. So it can't be the coach that's selling you all the big dreams and the shiny objects and the Lamborghinis and the Gucci bags and all that shit. I'm not yeah. saying you don't want that. I quite like having some designer stuff now and yeah, then. Yeah. Um, and that's fine. But for me, one of the biggest things I learned was investing in mentors and coaches that aren't haven't just walked the walk, they're still walking the walk. Yes. Um, because things change, yeah. right? And I remember in COVID, loads of people had to pause their mentorship because they couldn't afford to pay it anymore. The mentor I was working with at the time paused charging anyone yeah. because if anything, that's when we need a mentor the most. Yes. And I remember being in a mastermind where we're meeting online, obviously on Zoom, yeah. all locked in and we were all like, what are we doing? How are we pivoting? And then it was like, right, who's getting a loan? Who's doing this? And it was almost like we all figured it out together. Yeah. I could not imagine being yeah, on my yeah. own at that point in time. Yeah, that would have been a challenge. Mm. Yeah, 100%. I think the, the, you're exactly right in what you're saying. The, 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 I think the self-development world, world, it's not a regulated world. It, there's, there, it is like the World Wide West. There's a lot of people who can go and hire a Ferrari and go and do stuff. And that's where due diligence is so important and i've bought some bad stuff and i've bought some good stuff and i learned i learned but then learning again but i think um it's really important as you say to to be people that are walking the walk and that's why i still run my my tree surgery business i run a tree surgery mastermind but people come to me because they go well this guy's running the business and mm -hmm. he's also now now showing it and we let people into our training center into our office and i mean no one's done that in the tree surgery industry ever everyone's been very very close but i think that comes hand in hand that's why you know nick james is a, a mastermind i really enjoy being part of because he's very open this is my expert business this is what i show you he's got they go hand in hand mm -hmm. together it works really really well so yeah yeah i love that and that's one of the reasons why obviously we met through nick james so shout out to nick for doing a great yeah. job and bringing us all together yeah um but one thing i love about him and some of the masterminds i'm in is the honesty and transparency yes. they don't come in i remember when i used to mentor because obviously i do a lot of book writing and mentoring now but i used to run a mastermind as well for female entrepreneurs and i remember the temptation of not telling your clients that you're in the shit yeah because you're like i need to show face and i need to keep yes. da, 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 and i need to you know and actually coming in and being like actually we're really struggling we've lost some tough or we're struggling we've had this issue it shows that honesty and that vulnerability and then also sometimes the other people go have you tried this and you're like Oh my God, no. Yeah. <laughs> like something so obvious. And it's just learning for them. We've had this exact thing this year. We actually are, are, we've gone from six teams down to four teams. Our revenue has dropped slightly. Um, we lost a bit of work. Budgets are being cut as they have been in the UK right now with one of our MOD clients. And at first, my first thought was like, oh, this is not good because I'm going to go and tell all these people I'm mentoring that like our business is a bit of a downturn. And I was like, no, like transparency, honesty, like I, I've got to live to my values. Otherwise that doesn't, that doesn't feel good. Um, and also it's a massive learning um, because everybody gets still gets caught in the industry of like, how many staff you got? How many staff you got? How many staff you got? Um, and I was like, no, like it's sometimes if I'm going to sit here and tell people that my biggest mistake when the, before the business went under was not laying people off and I then don't do that and then get myself in, into, into a difficult position again, then I'm not helping people. I'm completely disaligned with myself. And yeah. that's why it's so important to be open and honest. Mm. I think just, yeah, I can. I could not recommend if anybody's listened to this about living your life transparent and your heart on your sleeve. Mm, yeah, and that's why people are so inspired, though, right? That's why people work with you, Henry. That's why people listen to podcasts because they're so inspired by the honesty. Same with us. Like the amount of times <laughs> I was literally running a five day challenge this week, and somebody asked the question on the live. And I just said the raw and real answer. And I saw one of my team members on the call, like giggle. And I was like, she's not going to lie. Honestly. <laughs> I was very honest, but yeah. I think that's what inspires people, you know, yeah. to be honest. And that's why we've been so inspired by you, Henry, just coming on the show and even just knowing you, just your honesty is really you. inspiring. Curious, who has inspired you on your journey? Are there like any mentors or other authors you've read and you think, God, that person has inspired me? Uh, it's a great question. So definitely, um, 
Matthew Syed from Black Box Thinking. He always already he writes another book called Bounce. Both brilliant, brilliant books. That has completely changed my thoughts. Richard Branson inspires me just because again he came from being dyslexic um, and just being able to to turn that around um, and, and make that a real positive. And he just seems like a really good human being. A really good. I like. I love entrepreneurs that are um, a positive. Um, and not full of BS. Um, and the other person is Jay Allen, um, who I've only recently met a year and a half ago. We were talking about him a minute ago, having a cup of tea. Um, his story is phenomenal. Um, and he is um, now a business partner, um, also one of my coaches. And he's just really, really helped me um, mm. along the journey. Yeah, he's amazing. We were literally just talking about getting him on the podcast, weren't mm. we? Because he's he's got such an inspiring story and I've met him. We both actually s- spoke at Expert Empires yeah. 2023. Um and it's such a fascinating story. Yeah, such it a is. fascinating story. It is. Yeah, fantastic. Oh, Henry, it's been great having you on the show. Thank, Thank you for you. recommending Jay as well as one of our guests. Um, I'll definitely be reaching out to him to get him booked on. And thank you for just being so transparent and honest. It's so refreshing. One of the big things about our show is taking the mask off. You know, whether you're an author, a speaker, a podcaster, an expert, take the mask off, leave it at the door. But yeah. like you said, take the ego, you know, leave yeah. it at the door. It's like, and there's been a few times on the show where there's still been a bit of mask and we have to get through yeah. it. But um, thank you for leaving it at the door and actually just being so honest. It's been yeah. super inspiring. Well, thanks for having me on and uh, watch this space for the Fail 4 book in the future. Yes, you heard it here. You <laughs> yeah. heard it here first. Thank you, Henry. Thanks, Chloe. Wow, what an episode. I mean, can you get a more inspiring person than Henry? He's I've known him for years, but even just hearing his journey and seeing the last few years of him going through his stroke and his businesses and so on, I mean, so, so inspiring. So if you haven't already, if you are watching us on YouTube, do share in the comments what has been the most inspiring part of Henry's story. What have you taken from this episode that you can use in your life, in your business to help you inspire others? And if you are listening on any of the podcast platforms, Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts, do make sure you come over to our YouTube channel as well and you can subscribe and follow for more so you don't miss out on our next inspiring guest. I'll see you next week. Yay!